Rachel Barrymo. Before we get started, just a quick reminder um, to turn off your cell phones if you happen to have one with you or other mobile devices that might click or clack or ring. Mm -hmm. And um, also to remind you, Bookstock is a volunteer-run organization um, and free to the public. So um, if you have the opportunity and can help support us, all donations are gratefully appreciated and there's a spot on your way out that you can um, tuck something into if you can. Um, but we also have support from a number of generous organizations and individuals, including the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Pauline Davenport Children's Fund um, of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, the Woodstock Learning Lab. We also have special thanks to our media sponsors, CA TV Channel 8 um, and the Vermont Standard, um, Vermont's oldest independent bookstore, the, the Yankee Bookshop, which um, they're selling books right outside, one of my former students and um, Sustainable Woodstock, which has helped put this together. Um, and we operate all on local grants and generosity, so we appreciate everyone who helps out. Um, we are, you're really in for a treat today. We have a brand new author, Rachel Barenbaum, although she's already on her third book, so she's not gonna be brand new for very long. Um, she has degrees from Harvard in business, literature, and philosophy, and in a former life, she was a hedge fund manager and a spin instructor until she found writing <laughs> at this level. She is also a prolific writer and reviewer for the LA Review of Books and Dead Darlings. And this is her debut novel, Abend in the Stars, that she's going to introduce us to today. It came out just a couple of months ago. Um, and I'm 100 pages in, I haven't finished it, but I'm loving it, and so I think you will too. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, thanks, <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Um, so, uh, this uh, book, Abend in the Stars, I always tell people the quick story about what it's about is a Jewish scientist racing Einstein to prove relativity. And then I always get the first question, well, why'd you think about that? Um, and I love to tell this story. Uh, and it started in 2014. I was reading an issue of Scientific American, and it said, 100 years ago this month, Albert Einstein was just on the edge of proving relativity. He had the theory, he had you know, um, the equations, but he needed physical evidence. He needed a picture of light bending. Um, and that was physical evidence that it could only come from a total solar eclipse. And one was coming. It was due over Russia. Uh, he just had to get there. So he assembled a team. He raised money. He sent them off. They were going to get his picture. It was his grand moment. But World War I started. They didn't get across the border. <laughs> no one got a picture of the eclipse that happened over Russia. But I thought, before I even put that down, I thought this would be an amazing book because Einstein wasn't working in a vacuum. There were other people trying to prove relativity, trying to come up with better equations, trying to get that photograph. So what if somebody else did it? What if someone beat Einstein? So that meant setting, a book, setting this book in Russia. And I grew up with great grandparents whose family fled from Russia, pogroms and anti-Semitism. And Russia in our house, it was a bad word. We were not allowed to speak Russian. We were not allowed to speak Yiddish. We were American. We spoke English, and uh, so I knew that would cause a little bit of friction, and I thought a lot about my great aunts, who used to call me over pretty much every week. They would pull me over, and they would bend down, and they would say, Rachel, do you have your passport? Do you know where the emergency money is? And I would always nod and say yes, because I did, but their breath smelled like herring and onions, and I was so scared. But yes, I knew where it was, because I had always been told to, you know, to be ready, ready to run. We might have to run at any time. So I would always say to them, but how do I know when it's time? When do we need to run? And they would say, you'll know. And I would say, but how, right? I mean, that act of leaving everything you know, you love, your home, maybe every penny you have, that, I, I couldn't even imagine. How do we know when it's time? Well, they never answered. And it is no coincidence that this book opens with brothers and sister, Miri and Vanya, asking their grandmother, is it time to run? They're in Russia. Vanya is the scientist racing Einstein. He will not leave until after the eclipse, until after he gets his photograph. So he goes for it, and he goes missing. So his sister Miri, she's one of the very first surgeons, female surgeons in Russia, goes after him. She's the hero of the book. She's the hero of the story. There's love, there's science, there's adventure. And above all, Abend in the Stars is really a story about survival, about the human will to find a better life, a better future. Now another key to this book, as I said it, of course, in 1914. 
This is a time period that I have been obsessed with, that I have loved for a very long time. It was a moment, an explosion of ideas, of innovations, of creations. It was just this moment where there was a blooming, right, in arts, in philosophy, in science, of course. Now, it all culminates in the most horrific war, World War I, but before it, right on the edge, we have ideas that are coming, a faith in human ability, a belief in truth, a belief that we can find answers to the universe, to all kinds of things. We are on the edge, and then we slip into World War I. Now, one of the people, of course, who was on the edge leading this push for truth, for answers, is Einstein. And at the time, right earlier, he's working in the patent office, right, and very famously sitting there. Um, what most people don't talk about is the fact that what he was working on, what he was examining, were inventions to synchronize clocks. Because at the time, for the very first time, we have trains, we have transportation, right? You don't have to live right next to where you're going to work. You can travel. But if you're going to get on a train, you need a schedule. And for that, you need to all agree on time. So what is time? That's the very first question. That's what I first came to this book thinking, what I came to college thinking. I sat down in my very first philosophy class. You know, I sit down at Harvard and the professor says, what is time? And I'm, you know, thinking I'm so smart, like minutes, seconds, hours, right? No, 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 no. What is time? Those are just inventions. That's just something we made up, a convention that we all agree on. If you're sitting on the moon, if you're on another planet, right, there's no such thing as time like that. So Einstein's sitting there thinking, how do we synchronize clocks? And that leads him to light. So again, we're on this idea of what is time. And one of the highlights of the book, or I think one of the markers of the book, is uh, there are three different clocks that I refer to in here, of course. So there's the uh, Hebrew Jewish calendar, which is different. Days, for example, uh, start at sundown, not at 12 midnight. There's the Russian calendar, which is a few weeks different from even the American calendar. And I reference all these different times in order to have us thinking, you know, what is time? Why are we so bound up in this? There are all kinds of expressions. You know, are we wasting time? Are we killing time? Right? What's a minute? What's an hour? I mean, time is a very, um, you know, people think about it, I think, more than, more than they admit or maybe more than they know. And maybe we should think about it in a different way. So uh, I set the book. Um, according to, in sections according to the Jewish calendar. And so every section starts with a new Jewish month. And I explain in the beginning, the Hebrew calendar is based on three astronomical phenomena, the rotation of the earth on its axis, the revolution of the moon around the earth, and the movement of the earth around the sun. So we start in the month of Tammuz. The fourth month in the Jewish calendar is Tammuz, from the Aramaic meaning heat, fire, or sun. It's said that during Tammuz, in the midst of battle, Joshua ordered the sun to stand still. God heard his pleas, and the day stopped. Only the moon continued, sliding in front of the sun. So there we go in the very beginning of the book. Um, and then we move into meeting the characters. So again, we're set in 1914, and this is in Kovno, which was then a part of Russia. Now it's Kaunas, Lithuania. So we've, you know, the geography, or the geography is the same, but the names of the cities, the places are all a little bit different. But we are in 1914, the huge empire, the Tsar controls a huge swath of the earth, um, and we meet our characters. On the 18th of Tammuz, Miri Abramov sat at the window in her room watching the slip of a moon emerge behind the mottled rooftops of Kovno. Her shoulders were slumped forward and curls escaped from the braid running down her back. She was exhausted from tending to dozens of patients and couldn't stop thinking about one in particular, the fishmonger. She lit a cigarette, watched smoke finger the polished glass in front of her. He'd been beaten so severely, Miri didn't recognize him, and his was a face she knew. He brought her family his catch every Monday. The word Jew had been scrawled on his chest with so much hate that the charcoal used to write it cut his skin. The letters oozed red. His ribs were cracked, and Miri was sure his spleen was pierced. She needed to operate to save his life. But she wasn't a surgeon. She was still training, couldn't do anything without permission, and all the surgeons above her, men, disagreed with her diagnosis. They said he was only bruised. But she'd watched his condition deteriorate. 
She'd recorded his pulse rising, his blood pressure dropping, along with his increasing confusion, all signs he was bleeding internally. Would he make it through the night? The grandfather clock downstairs struck the hour. It was time for supper. Mary stubbed her cigarette in a pile of ash on a cold saucer and made her way into the hall. Standing on thick woven carpet, Mary took a deep breath and arranged her face. Making an appearance downstairs in the crowded sitting room where she'd find her grandmother always made Mary feel as if she were on stage. The house, the paintings, the silks and velvets were props in Babushka's exquisite theater. Her grandmother was Kovno's most illustrious matchmaker, and she was paid in gifts. Everything her family had was chosen for them. The house was given by the owner of the brick factory on the night of his wedding. Beds were delivered by a carpenter once he held his first child. Baba's clients furnished one room and then another. All of her needs were provided for in this way. Babushka found wives for tailors who sent clothing and fishmongers, like Miri's patient, who delivered food. The only thing Baba refused was help. She didn't want a cook or a maid. She was the keeper of secrets, she explained with a wink. One clients never questioned. And Miri knew they were lucky to live so well, especially when so many Jews scavenged for food and heat. She was grateful for it, but none of it felt like a home. Baba was her home and had been since her parents left for America 15 years earlier when Miri was six and her brother Vanya was 12. The plan had been for the three of them to join Mama and Papa after they were settled, but their parents' boat sank during a storm. The loss spun Miri into a darkness that left her limp. Every night after Babushka kissed them and thought they were in bed, Vanya rocked Miri until her silent tears stopped and whispered stories their mother used to tell. Stories about brave girls and boys who fought Baba Yaga. Stories about fearless children who dared travel across Russia in search of treasure. Miri's favorite was Levi's monster. Levi refused to follow the rabbis and throw his sins into the river every year at Rosh Hashanah. Instead, he let them pile up until they grew into a powerful ogre that Levi had to defeat to save his wife and children. Like Levi, Vanya pushed Miri to fight, and she did. She learned to tuck the darkness away. Sometimes, though, it iced its way back, and she felt it then as she stood outside her room worrying about the fishmonger. But she had to go on, Vanya would say, and she knew he was right. She straightened her back and started down the stairs. In the front hall, Miri found the usual line of mothers and grandmothers spilling out from the sitting room. The few that spotted her nodded a greeting, but she knew they didn't dare stand or move to kiss her for fear they might lose their place in line. All were waiting their turn for an audience with Babushka for a chance to plead for help in matching their children. Miri leaned against the polished wooden doorframe. It wouldn't be long before Baba spotted her and realized how late it was. Then she'd finish for the night and Miri would help her usher the women out so they could sit down to eat together. Baba sat on her perch, dressed in aquamarine, with her thick silver braid resting over her shoulder. She was as wide as she was tall, and she had a chair on stilts with a footrest to match so she could sit at eye level with her visitors. She held the hands of the seamstress, Katinka, who was afflicted with a curved spine that kept her half bent. She was there for her son, who had a business delivering vegetables. He's a good boy, Katinka said. Miri knew that since Baba held Katinka's hands, they were just beginning, and the seamstress would be cut short. Does he drink too much? Baba asked. Sometimes. Every woman knew to be honest. Does he fight? Use his fists? Never. Good, Baba said. What else? He tells me stories about love, about the future. He understands better days will come. Perhaps not this year, but they will come. Baba paused and looked up, sensing Miri's arrival. She nodded at her granddaughter, then leaned toward Katinka. You'll unwrap his story for me in the morning. Katinka exhaled, showing she understood this meant Babushka would consider his case, and her chest crumpled as if she'd been holding her breath. Thank you, thank you, the seamstress said. Babushka squeezed Katinka's hands. More tomorrow. 
All of you, more tomorrow, she said, as she turned to face the rest of the room. The women grumbled. Some must have waited for hours and still hadn't been heard. And while the rabbi stayed as late as he was needed, Babushka did not. Her clients knew she required sleep to clear her head, to make better matches, and so no one argued. They all wanted to remain on her better side. Just before Mary stepped into the room to help urge the women along, Yuri walked in through the front door. She heard him even before she saw him. One of his legs was shorter than the other, and the shim he used to compensate creaked when he walked. His gold watch swayed like a pendulum from his vest, and he was still in his white surgeon's coat. Yuri Chaimovich, Mary said, excited and alarmed because they'd said their good nights at the hospital. His being there meant something was wrong. She hurried to him. Before he'd even had time to hang his hat, she asked, what's happened? Why have you come? It's agreed. Finally, out of breath, he put his bag down and took her hands. They stood eye to eye. You left early for the first time. He gulped for air. The fishmonger, if he survives the night, the other surgeons, they've agreed you're correct. His spleen must be removed, and they've agreed you will do it. You will operate alone. She must have stepped forward. They were closer now. He kissed her cheek. You're being elevated to surgeon. He'll be saved, yes, by your hand. It would be better now. We need to operate now. Hearing the news also had Miri out of breath. Her words came quickly. He'll lose less blood, have a better chance to live. You know the operating theaters are shuttered at night. We can't see well enough. He pushed so close, his legs pressed on her skirts. Did you hear me? You're being promoted. Surely we can compensate with candles or gas lamps. We can't, he cleared his throat. Miriam, you're a surgeon now. The house behind them was loud with women's voices, but as the news took hold, it all seemed far away from where Mary stood. Surgeon, she said, you're certain. So many mocked her ambitions because she was a woman. Enough told her to give up the dream that she'd begun to hear them, to accept she would never be promoted, no matter how great her skills, but oh, how she wanted it. The title would allow her to act without seeking permission, which meant she'd be able to save so many more. She reached for a bench to steady herself. I wouldn't say it if I wasn't certain. You'll save him tomorrow on your own. Yuri smiled. He rarely showed emotion. To gain a patient's trust, he taught, a doctor must appear impartial, neutral to all news. But when he broke his rule for her, she loved it. She thought he looked lighter, younger. I'll be there if you need me, but you will operate on your own. How did you convince them? We'll leave it there for now. And I will move on. So there you meet some of the initial main characters. Um, and then I'm going to get into the next chapter. So I don't actually, I just moved from Israel about two weeks ago. So all my books are in transit. So I'm actually borrowing a book. So I don't have one that's marked up. So just bear with me for a minute um, while I look for this next page. Um, so one of the things that happens, of course, in life, um, let's see, I think it's around right here. Yeah. Uh, is, I thought it was here. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the things, of course, that happens in life is you think you're on one direction. You think you're going to be a doctor. You think you're going to live in Kovno for your whole life. And uh, things change, right? Or you decide, this isn't the path that I want to be on. You want things to change. And uh, my characters in this book change. And I like people to think, or I hope that you think about when you're reading this, that you too right, can make these changes. We have these inflection points. Maybe we think we're going in this direction, but it's never too late. You can always decide to take a turn, go a different path. So here we see Mary is about to hit a different path. Mary hurried. Without the sun, the air was tinged with the smell of damp. And the limestone buildings that framed the road looked darker than they should. 
As she descended into the slums, streetlights cast shadows that magnified the laddered appearance of the tiled rooftops. She tucked Tamara's hat into her bag and tried to think about how she'd break the news to Anatoly's mother. She thought she was following, Tamara, following Tamara's careful directions, but she didn't know this section of the city, and in four turns, she was lost. She tried to retrace her steps, but when she came out at the river, she knew she was even farther from where she wanted to be, deep in the city's underbelly of mills and factories. She looked around, tried to plan her route home. The triangular roof on the tower of Kovno Castle loomed in the distance. The bulk of the train station rose nearby, and the great bridge hung overhead. She'd always seen it from above, where the stanchions were polished and the roads sparkled with lamps. But from this new perspective, she saw it was decrepit, and the riverbank that appeared pristine was, in fact, a wasteland of gravel littered with rags and fish heads coated in pollen. At least she knew the way back from here. As Mary turned toward the path leading uphill, a train shot over the bridge. The wheels pummeled the rails with a force that made the shore vibrate. Cattle car after cattle car barreled across. When the engine's roar was gone, Mary heard a new sound, splashing and kicking at a desperate, fevered pace. Someone had fallen from the train and was swimming toward her. Mary crouched in the shadow under the great bridge and watched the swimmer. There was no wind, no moon, only the reflection of streetlights on the river. The swimmer was a man. His kick was fierce, but he pulled with only one arm. The water rippled in strange patterns under his desperate stroke. He must have been injured, and the river's temperature would only make his swim harder. Its water flowed down from ice in the mountains, so that even in summer it was frigid. Still, he fought. She wondered who he was. A Bolshevik? A criminal? She couldn't bring herself to leave until she was certain he'd made it safely ashore. Mary narrowed her, uh, her eyes as if squinting could help her see him better, but instead she heard footsteps nearby. On the other side of a hodgepodge of weeds and brush, she saw the silhouettes of two men making their way up the river, walking in her direction. The men stumbled, drunk. Were they coming for the swimmer? Mary realized she was hidden from view and trapped. If she moved, they'd see her. If they came for her, no one was there to help. She braced herself against a damp slab of stone. Tilly Baum, the men sang, close your eyes. The night hides everything. The night birds are chirping. Their words were slurred. They plopped down on a fallen tree with a thud that cracked the trunk. They spilled over the side laughing and then climbed back up, set to starting a fire. Miri waited for the drunks to look at the swimmer. He was at the shore now, but they kept their backs to him. They were consumed by vodka, nothing else. The swimmer swayed in a reflected pool of light from the lamps on the bridge. Water vapor melted up from his skin and clothes, the contrast of hot to cold blurring his outline. Still, Miri could see he was tall. His hair was black and it hung down ragged. He examined the beach as if searching for danger. When his glance reached the bridge, Miri knew he couldn't see her, but she felt he looked straight at her. She expected to see a fierceness in his gaze. For him to survive that fall and that swim, he had to be ferocious. But in his face, she saw he was terrified. He dragged a huge piece of cloth, maybe a coat, twisted around his foot, and took four steps into the shadows, where he was hidden from the drunks by the brush. His teeth chattered as he fell on one knee. She guessed he was near Vanya's age. He wore a uniform, and when the buttons on his tunic caught the light, they glinted at uneven intervals. Mismatched buttons meant he didn't have access to proper supplies. Jews and gypsies were denied those basics, but they were supposed to be posted in the south, far from Kovno by now. Could the swimmer be either? Miri looked again to the drunks. They were blind to what was happening behind them. Best to run, she decided. She stood, and a single branch snapped under her weight. Who's there? How many of you? The swimmer asked, looking straight at her. Four of us, Miri said, in the deepest voice she could muster. Before she could turn to run, he had her. One hand around her arm, the other over his mouth. She hadn't thought he was well enough to move that quickly. 
She shoved him, pushing hard where she saw blood between his shoulder and neck, and he grimaced, releasing his hold. He bent forward with his hand on his wound, but didn't come back at her. Please, I won't hurt you, he said between gasps. I just want you to be quiet. So the drunks don't hear, he looked up. Can you help me find a doctor? Doctor, Miri asked. He dropped back to his knees, landed with a thud that sent up a spray of gravel. Why would I help you? You haven't run yet. I'm hoping that means you have a reason. If you could make that swim, you're not dying, she said. You'll likely only need stitches. The cold will keep down the swelling. You'll lose less blood. There's a hospital in the city. You're a nurse then? No, I am a doctor, she answered, and then cringed. She couldn't be telling him this much, nor did she feel she had the right to the title, not after Anatoly. The drunks bellowed another round of Tilly Tilly Bomb. Doctor, will you help me? So I will leave it there. Mm. You can read the rest to see what happens. <laughs> So said we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're in good time now. We have until 8.40 to finish up questions. Oh, OK. 3.40. 3.40? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> OK, more time than I thought. So. <laughs> Did you write the book in it while you were in Israel? Uh, no, not this one. But my next book that will come out in 21, The History of Time Travel, I did write in Israel. Oh. So. How long did you live there? Uh, a year. Hmm. Just a year. In Jerusalem? or? A suburb of Tel Aviv called Ranana. Ah. I lived in Israel for a year, so. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very different from mm -hmm. Woodstock. <laughs> but great to be here. So, what can I tell you? Yes. So, I may have my history wrong. Sure. But the part we, you said Einstein sent a team to get that photograph. Is that in fact true, or is that part of a fictional? That is in fact true. Okay, because I knew other teams had done that. I did not know Einstein actually sent folks to get that photograph. Yeah, he did. And there were other people going, too. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, um, I, uh, their camp is set up in Brovery, right outside of Kiev. And I based it on photographs from uh, an expedition that was there specifically for the eclipse. Um, and they reported that it was um, cloudy, and so they couldn't get any pictures. But you know, such a huge swath of the country covered in this eclipse. Someone had to get a picture, right? So would the, I know they eventually got that picture, but was it, was it that eclipse or was it 1919. Years? I thought it was several Eddington, years Eddington, famously. Okay, that's yeah, why I didn't pay. realize Einstein did. Yeah, and actually it was a good thing that he didn't. Um, Einstein's math was not right in 1914. Um, his equations for relativity, so um, basically the theory of Relativity, if I could sum it up in a few words, right? Without the math, is right. If you imagine, um, if you and I were holding a sheet, right, and we pull it tight, it's flat. If you put, um, you know, a circle in the middle, then you have an, an indent, right? That would be like the sun in space. So you have an, an indent. Space isn't just flat, right? And if you tried to roll an apple or a ball towards that sun, it wouldn't go in a straight line, right? It has to go around. It goes around the, the dent there. And so he, what he wanted was this picture of not the ball going around the sun, but the light going around the sun. And the math calculates by how much that light shifts or is bent, right, by that curve. And at the time, Newton was, you know, the gold standard and everyone used his equations and they were off by a factor that was not acceptable, you know, which led him to believe it wasn't right. Um, and then Einstein's math in 1914 was better, but still not right. He wasn't really known for being a famous mathematician, more of an idea man. Um, and uh, so by the time 1919 came around, he actually had better math that was much more precise and a better photograph <laughs> or a photograph. And uh, you know, sometimes I wonder, well, what if he had come out in 1914, if he had gotten the photograph, if he had published math that wasn't that good, what would have happened? Don't know. So yeah. What else? Any other questions? Yeah. So there's a book, uh, and I believe it's called Einstein's Wife. Um, and it seems to imply that uh, even though it's a novel, that she was really the brains behind the theory of relativity, but yeah. she got shoved aside. And yeah. The paper that was supposed to have both names on it. So, do you have an opinion about that? Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> right? I, I have no idea what you don't know what happens in a marriage. You don't know what happens, right, in a relationship or when you're working with somebody. I certainly know that. Uh, it, it would have been the right thing to put her name on some of those papers, for sure. Who actually had the idea or which math, I have no idea. But um, she was certainly a, a force 
and a brilliant woman and uh, had some amazing ideas and some amazing math abilities. So I don't know, right? Right. That's, that's the fun of historical fiction is you can write books like that and choose your side or, you know, pump up one side or the other or whatever it is. So, yeah. yeah. Did you travel to Kovno as a part of researching this? So, um, I mentioned that Russia was a bad word in my family <laughs> growing up, right? <laughs> and so, so I was sort of forbidden to ever go to that area. So I have not been, and, and although those relatives of mine are all gone and sadly um, deceased, I, they're like, they're in my head, right? And every time I look to buy a ticket to go, um, I, I sort of hear them. And uh, so I haven't been, although I have looked at uh, countless, I mean, uh, thousands of pictures from that area, from my family. National Geographic did an amazing um, expose on Russia. It came out, I think, it was like one month before World War II, World War I broke. And it was these amazing pictures all across uh, the empire. And, you know, such a huge swath of the world at that point, and all these different people. And um, I bought a copy of it on eBay. And, you know, that is a, sort of those kinds of pictures, I think, really helped me and family stories and family <coughs> lore helped me really to imagine what it looks like. Um, and in a way that is hard to do even just from uh, books because there, you know, I picked up on um, some details. For example, if you were in a train in 1914, there would be a hook um, in the engine room where you'd have goggles dangling, right? And some of the ways that this came to life for me that I was able to write this as if I were in the scene was I could imagine those goggles, right, hanging in the train. <laughs> so uh, there's some, you know, so I didn't travel there, but I have looked at many, 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 many photographs <laughs> and old movies. Yeah, so. Was there an aha moment when you realized you wanted to be an author? Um, so I've been writing books since like third grade. Oh. <laughs> so I have always, always been writing. I have wow. many, many books in the drawer that will never see the light of day, and that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. It's, so it always sounds kind of funny when people say, "This is her first novel." It's like, well, this is my first published novel, <laughs> but it is one of many. And I think any writer that you talk to that's being honest has many, many books, yeah. stories that will never see the light of day. Mm -hmm. So I've always known, and yeah. Uh, yeah, finally made it happen. So yeah, we went to a reading uh, recently by John Clinch, and he said that he had six novels that he had written that he couldn't get published. They're in the drawer. And they're, yeah, they're yeah. in the drawer. Yeah. Um, but he, he said that when he writes, he doesn't do a draft. He just, it, it forms in his mind and he just writes it and he never corrects it. Do you have a writing style where you sit down every day and yeah. know, just get something on paper or? Right, um, so I sort of envy writers like that. <laughs> and Toni oh, really? Morrison, right? She writes like the perfect page every day or something, and she doesn't go back. But no, so I write every six days a week, and um, I generate a huge amount, uh, usually like 10 pages a day. And of those 10 pages, you know, maybe a paragraph makes it into the book. So I've, you know, there are 464 pages in here, and I wrote thousands and thousands of pages. And I, you know, that's just my style. And uh, because I see a story, I see a scene in my head, and I write it. And then you go, and then I go back, and I think, oh, that really sounded bad, or you know. And I'm of the mind that bad writing is better than no writing. And so, you know, it's easier to fix a bad scene, a cliche, a terrible character, than not to have the character or the terrible scene. So, yeah. So that's how I do it. Yeah. Oh, I love it, you guys. Yeah. So. <laughs> She said you were a hedge fund manager. Yeah. <laughs> Did you put that in order to write, or for other, if I might ask, <laughs> for other, what was your motivation to to not do that anymore? To not do that ask? anymore? You know, I know. Um, so I started uh, this about the time that I started this book. I sat down and I just thought to myself, you know, ten years from now, where do you want to be? And uh, what do you want to be doing? Do you still want to be trading stocks? And it's fun to trade stocks, you know, if, if you're doing well <laughs> right? and, and you have people. But um, there's, uh, I don't know, that's not, you know, I didn't want to look back and say 10 years from now, yeah, I'm still trading stocks. So I just got up the courage finally 
and said, I'm, I'm, I quit. I closed my fund and I started doing it full time. And uh, right about that time, what helped me do that was I was accepted to the Novel Incubator Program, uh, which is through Grub Street. And not everyone does that full time, but you have to have a full draft of your book. So I have this full draft and then I spent a whole year working on it with them. And uh, yeah, and I just went all in. <laughs> There's something about that terror, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> that I don't know, put it over the edge. So. so we know the science part of Einstein was real, but what about Mary? Is, is she rooted in a real person? So Mary is the sister. She's the real heroine, and she saves the family. Um, so she is based on a number of uh, female surgeons that were in Russia at the time. So in 1914, they were just starting to sort of pop up. I found, I think, three. But all of them had been educated outside of Russia. So they were educated in Switzerland or uh, Germany, right? And then they came to practice in Russia. Um, and so I took sort of what I thought their experience would be like. And of course, and it, most women practicing, they weren't practicing medicine. They were midwives, right? Were helping with birthing and delivery and stuff. And um, Mary is a very ambitious character and she wants more and she wants health, right? For women, for people. And so I didn't think that she would be happy uh, being a midwife. I thought she'd want to operate to be a surgeon. So yeah, so I based it on that. And, and it is sort of an esoteric um, medical system, or it wasn't, maybe it still is, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you have to be elevated. You could be a doctor and, you know, and there's sort of a lower level, which just means you can hang your shingle, your shingle, but, you know, to get up to a surgeon, you have to be elevated, even though you're all called doctor at the same time. So it was a little confusing on that research front as to what kind of doctor or surgeons were these women. But it was really the beginning, and um, I so admire people that push to be the first in their field. And uh, so I just loved that they were starting to be there, and so I knew that's what she had to be. Yeah. Time yeah. for a couple more questions, and then she can sign outside. Mm -hmm. about Russia, Israel, writing. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you say, uh, as, a, as a young girl, you were living when you were, might have had to run? Uh, Philadelphia, I didn't say. Really? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, we were in Philly, so they, uh, wow. yeah, and it's, um, it, it's, uh, especially in, uh, when I gave a couple of book talks in Israel, I had a number of people who grew up with a similar um, mentality of, where's your passport? Always make sure your passport is up to date, and that you have enough money that you can buy a ticket, and you can get out, and it's, uh, yeah. So you are running from, from immigration? Forces or pogroms and anti-Semitism is what my family left. In Philadelphia. No, in Russia. In Russia. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what the, they they came from that. So my they my grandparents, and their family <laughs> left yeah. Russia. So you were in Philadelphia, but they still had this mentality. Yeah, so they still okay, right, you weren't yeah. actually in, in danger in Philadelphia. No, but I but guess it's Syria. like the um, to be I guess right there's this trauma that you internalize, and so they wanted to make sure we you know our family ran from Russia. You might have to run. You feel safe. We felt safe, right? And you make these exceptions and you say, oh, it's okay, I'll just get used to this. Or, you know, I just don't, you know, I just won't do that. Or Jews just don't do that. Or, you know, and, you, and then you realize your life is narrowing, narrowing, narrowing. And this, this gets back to this question of how do I know when it's time to run, yeah. right? And so they said, well, you'll know. <laughs> I guess they knew. So they left. And so they thought it, you know, it was their job to make sure that I was always ready to run. Because once you run, once you make that decision, you're done. You need to go. You need to drop everything. And so I needed to be ready. In today's political atmosphere of intolerance, <laughs> yeah. is that a flame of fear being rekindled or uneasiness? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think I've spoken should to, be. <laughs> should be. I've spoken to a number of readers who understand, you know, this was 1914, <clears throat> Russia, and they say, but this is, you know, 2014, <laughs> my family living here or here, and we also had to run. And so you, uh, there's this understanding, even though you know, now we have cell phones and you can see the pictures of people piling into boats in this horrific moment, right? You, they, you lived the same thing in 1914, that same horrific moment. And so you bridge that gap and it's just, it's terrifying. And those emotions are in, you know, here I am, three generations, right? My grandparents. <laughs> we and thought I'm, we were beyond this. Right, yeah. and I still have yeah. to have my passport. And these people, right, are like, people are still running, still trying to get new passports, still trying to get to this country or that country where they have a dream that they will have a better life. So it is, um, yes, very relevant to today. 
Do you, yes, do you still keep your passport and money handy? <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I can't go to Russia. Of course I've got my passport. 